Good morning and thank you for your cooperation in uh, being back on time. Our next speaker is Dr. Soumya Iyengar uh, from the National Brain Research Center in Manisar and she will speak on avian cognition from the perspective of neuroscience and behavior. Dr. Iyengar. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, going to be a bit of a switch because I'm going to now talk about even cognition. Um, I would like to thank the organizers who are considering uh, BIRDS 2 as far as cognition goes. And further, hopefully, at the end of the talk, maybe there would be some idea about consciousness as well. Uh, the students who have participated in, uh, in this or, and present, I, I'm going to present some of the data. Are Pooja, Alok, Shankmala, and my technician Krishna. So initially, it would be would have been surprising that birds were going to be presented in a meeting on cognition at all. Very early on, this is uh, at the beginning of. Um, it was about in the early 1900s. The uh, there was a lot on the development or the um, structure of the brain. And there are different parts of the brain. Here you can see this is a cross section of the rat brain. And the one above is from a bird, the zebra finch, which is a songbird. Now, there is a part of the, uh, of the brain which is on the outside. This is called the cortex. And here you can see in the human brain, this is a sagittal section or a half section of the human brain. You can see the cortex on the outside in green. And tucked away on the inside is this portion here, which is in purple, seen here in the rat. And this portion is the basal ganglia. Now, there are loops formed between and connections between the, this cortex on the outside, the basal ganglia, and another part of the brain, which is called the thalamus. And in fact, there are many such parallel loops in mammals, especially in uh, humans. But before I get to brain organization and loops, I would like to talk about the outer structure that is the neocortex. The neocortex is also called neocortex and it is supposed to have evolved in mammals and has re apparently reached its pinnacle in humans. It is six layered. Here is a section of the human cortex and you can see six layers of cells arranged one on top of the other. Now in birds, what was seen was that the inner part, this portion here, was supposed to be similar to this basal ganglia, which is supposed to be below the cortex or subcortical. There was a big part of the brain which was outside this, but this did not have the lamina. So for the longest time, this was considered to be striatal in nature. And the idea at that time was that birds just had a hypertrophied striatum, and a very small part on the top of the bird brain was supposed to be cortex. So this entire portion is marked in purple to show that it's actually striatum or subcortical. And this led to uh, the unified theory of brain evolution being postulated by Edinger. And he said that since large parts of the avian brain do not possess the six-layered pattern of the neocortex seen in mammals, the avian brain mainly consists of basal ganglia. Now, this outer part of the cortex has cells which are organized in not in any particular way. They eat, there are different divisions of that area, but they are, and there are some areas within the striatum, this hyper, so-called hypertrophied striatum, which are actually um, more um, organized to form groups of cells called nuclei. But in any case, the idea was that since there were no layers in this striatum, and they were given names like hyperstriatum, paleostriatum, neostriatum, etc., there was no possibility of birds ever producing anything like cognition. In fact, the hypertrophied basal ganglia in birds um, suggested to people at the time, the scientists at the time, that they were, birds were only capable of reacting instinctively to their environment and no higher cognitive functions were possible. And this gave rise to this term bird brain. In fact, um, Darwin had given this uh, theory of evolution and he uh, said that basically Evolution was progressive, and so was uh, obviously the development of brain structure. So it started with fish and amphibians at one end, and uh, finally reached humans at the other, and birds were somewhere in the middle. So clearly not able to do much in terms of cognition. 
Latest studies, of course, showed that this is not true. Birds have actually evolved after mammals and not before. So evolution is not linear or progressive, and similar traits or characters can actually emerge independently and more than once during evolution. Um, in fact, both birds and mammals uh, are uh, derived from stem amniotes, and there was a common ancestor of mammals and birds, which was present at ab about 320 million years ago. This was actually the work of Carol Evans and many others. And then this gave rise to uh, the sauropsids and therapsids. Now, both reptiles and birds have evolved from sauropsids, whereas mammals have evolved from therapsids, and this was about 250 million years ago. Whereas modern mammals arose 203 million years ago, birds have in fact evolved later, about 135 million years ago. So it's not true that birds actually evolved before mammals, they did so afterwards. And apparently so did their brain. So a number of studies was then, were then carried out by Harvey Carton's group and many other neuroanatomists who did injections into different parts of the bird's brain, looked at connections between different parts of the bird's brain, and what they found was that, in fact, the outer part of the avian brain, that is, they started calling it the pallium, it may constitute up to about 75% of the brain in some species of birds, and in fact is similar to the mammalian cortex. So the common ancestor, that is the stem amniote of birds, reptiles, and mammals, possessed this nuclear pallium, which evolved into a laminar pallium in mammals. And the six-layer neocortex was probably present in therapsids 25 million years ago, whereas the hyperpallium evolved more recently. So birds, again, the brain has also evolved more recently. Now, so after this, there was a change in all of these names. All these areas which were called hyperstriatum, mesostriatum, neostriatum, became nidopallium, mesopallium, hyperpallium, etc., to reflect this change in uh, the idea that this was actually cortex in birds. A further number of studies have been also performed looking at the expression of neurotransmitters, for example, those like acetylcholine, dopamine, and their patterns in birds, mammal, mammalian brains, and bird brains. Both of these happen to be uh, expressed to a greater extent in the striatum, and not so much in the cortex in mammals. And this was true of the bird pallium versus striatum, that outer part had less of acetylcholine and dopamine as compared to this inner part, that is the striatum, uh, in birds. Further, a uh, number of developmental studies were also performed. So there were certain transcription factors like EMX1, uh, PAX6, and uh, TBR, which were expressed in mammals in the cortex only. And it was found that these were present only in the bird pallium and not um, in the st uh, striatum. Now, expression further, uh, there were other markers like BDNF and MGLU-R1 and MGLU-R2. And these are, again, only found in the mammalian cortex and avian cortex. So again, avian pallium, sorry. And so this, these were, uh, had obviously wrongly been earlier designated as hyperstriatum, neostriatum, and so on and so forth. Uh, about the loops in the brain, so uh, here is a dissection of the human brain, and this is uh, again a sideways or a sagittal dissection of the human brain. Here you can see a cross-section of the cortex, and above, this is the outermost part is the cortex. You can see all the salsae and gyri where the, there are a very large number of neurons. This is taken from the human brain. This portion here, that is the caudate nucleus and the putamen, and this portion here, the globus pallidus, which is tucked inside, happens to be the basal ganglia. Now, there are connections or loops formed between the cortex projecting, by the cortex projecting onto the striatum, the striatum then projecting onto the globus pallidus, the globus pallidus projecting onto another region of the brain, which is called the thalamus, and the thalamus projects back onto the cortex. So uh, these loops have been formed through the brain, and they're particularly important for motor function, which is well known. The cortex then finally sends projections down to the spinal cord and to motor neurons in order to help us perform all the motor functions that we do. But in fact, the basal ganglia, these uh, loops are not only restricted to motor functions. So we have many such parallel loops in the brain. There are some which are important for orientation and case. So each one will start in the basal ganglia, go to the uh, thalamus, and then to the cortex and back again. And there are connections back and forth. Uh, 
Interestingly, cognitive processes, there are connections in the form of these basal ganglia loops also going back and forth to the dorsolateral, prefrontal cortex, lateral orbitofrontal cortex. And then there are also loops which are uh, governing limbic functions. Now, this is true of mammals. And in fact, in birds too, uh, it was found by doing a number of track tracing studies that these kinds of loops are present. So one example that I will take, there are many others, but one example that I will take is that of songbirds. Here you can see the mammalian basal ganglia loop going from cortex to the basal, from cortex to basal ganglia. This is striatum, pallidum, and then after that globus pallidus, and this is the thalamus. Thalamus goes back to the cortex, and this, tri this portion receives a lot of dopaminergic fibers from the substantia nigra. Now, similar to this, in songbirds, there is what is called the song control system. And the song control system, at least part of it, is organized in the form of this basal ganglia loop. So there are areas in the pallium which are important for song learning as well as song production. They, pro pro uh, they send their projections to another region, which is called area X. This is avian basal ganglia. The avian basal ganglia projects onto a part of the brain which is called thalam which is DLM. This is uh, part of the avian thalamus. And then this forms a loop by projecting back onto the pallium. And exactly similar, in a similar manner as in mammals, this striatum or area X in birds also receives a very uh, large number of dopaminergic fibers or uh, from the SNCVTA complex. This is these are circuit diagrams which have been uh, uh, made by doing a whole lot of track tracing studies. And this is by a very large number of scientists, so I'm not obviously going to name all of them. But these circuit diagrams are of the major sensory and motor neural circuits in birds and mammals. If I don't tell you which one is which, then it would take a little bit of time for you to discover which one was which. So you can see that obviously birds, and this is the one for birds, have a huge amount of neural substrate, which is important, uh, which is similar to mammals and may be important for their performing uh, the higher cognitive tasks and solving co uh, complex cogni cognitive problems. As far as avian cognition goes, um, besides the track tracing studies, the anatomical studies that I've been talking to you so far, number of, uh, a lot of research was also done on behavior. So uh, the zebra finch is one of the favorite models to look at song behavior. And singing in these birds is actually a learned behavior. So it's actually somewhat similar to the way we learn our languages from our parents and pick up speech from our parents. Zebra finches will pick up vocalizations. In this species, it's only the males that sing. They will listen to their father during a sensitive period and learn the vocalizations, which they will produce later in adulthood. And this song is used to attract um, mates, and in other songbirds, not zebra finches, used to defend their uh, small territories against rivals, and even uh, to fend off predators. Now, uh, besides this, there are, um, of course, the famous Alex studies. This was an African gray parrot, which Irene Pepperberg uh, spent many years doing research on. And Alex was able to name a very large number of objects. He could name or distinguish between at least a 1,000 different objects. He was able to uh, color code them. He knew about colors. He had an idea about numbers. He could do sums up to the number seven. And he even had the concept of zero. So Alex was a very, very smart parrot and did have mathematical abilities. Now, besides um, the studies on songbirds and African gray parrots, I would like to move on to um, specialists in the problem-solving field, that is corvids. And this is the family corvidae. Sorry for the spelling mistake. But these are uh, basically crows, rooks, ravens, magpies, jays, jackdaws, tree pies. These have been known for their problem-solving abilities and immortalized in uh, this thirsty crow story, which I'm sure everybody has heard about. This is, uh, uh, goes as far back as the Panchatantra in India, which was third century, and Aesop's fables also. Uh, this thirsty crow basically caught pebbles in its environment, raised the level of water in a pitcher which was uh, sitting around. This is, in fact, been shown in the lab as well. And this was uh, carried out by Bird and Emery on rooks. What they did was to take a beaker which was very narrow, so that the bird was not able to pull out anything with its beak. Neither could its head nor its beak go in. 
And what they did was they put some water inside and put a piece of food floating inside at the bottom. They provided the bird with pellets, and over time the bird learned to take these uh, pebbles and put them inside the beaker to raise the level of the water and then take this object, which is this food, which is floating on the top. Now, what they found was that if they took small pebbles versus larger pebbles, then the birds always chose the larger pebbles to be able to raise the level of the water faster. And they also exchanged the water for sawdust, and apparently the birds did not do the task, knowing that this strategy of putting pebbles inside the sawdust uh, would not help them retrieve the food object. Besides uh, these, uh, the raising of the water level, there were other cognitive abilities that corvids are known for, and these are across many different species. So magpies, for example, uh, display, are known to display object permanence. Besides, uh, there is a theory of mind, mental time travel, and tool use, which I will talk about across different species. So the specialists on tool use are a species of birds called New Caledonian crows. And what they do is they fashion these tools out of twigs and also out of what are called pandanus leaves in their uh, territories. And they use these little tools to dig out larvae for food in their vicinity. So what they, this bird is a bird called Betty. And this was a video which came from Chapel in Kesselnik. So uh, there's a bent tube here and there's a piece of food inside. You can see that she's trying to use a twig to pull out the food. And you can see that there is some amount of effort involved. She modifies the twig at one end because it's not going in. This is actually closed except for a very small opening. And once she gets it to the correct size, she will retry again. more effort, and finally she starts getting the object down through the tube. And here it goes. And unfortunately, there was a bird which was smarter than her sitting around. <laughs> she didn't get the food. So um, they are really intelligent. Um, what about mental time travel and theory of mind? OK, so this is uh, given by food caching in Corvids. There were birds called Clark's nutcrackers, which are found in Canada. These store about 30,000 caches of food in winter. So you can imagine what a formidable job it is for them to retrieve the food. But amazingly, they remember the uh, cache. They remember each of the sites. And they also remember the nature of the food, that is, whether it is perishable or non-perishable, and always consume the perishable stores before they consume the non-perishable ones. Um, the idea of theory of mind, when an individual can think about another's mental state, was given by the species of birds which are called Western scrub jays. Now, Western scrub jays basically are, again, food-storing birds. They cache their food. And they, the ones that are thieves, basically the ones that pilfer other stores, are known to be more careful about protecting their own stores because they know that what can happen to others can happen to them as well. So what they do is they avoid spectators while caching, they recache, they pretend to recache and hide inedible material when being observed. And if, however, the interesting thing is that if their mate is present, then they don't resort to these behaviors. So obviously it depends on who is observing this bird. Now, it was found that this was correlated, all these behaviors are, uh, were co well correlated with the size of the pallium in these birds. This is a cross-section of a rook steel encephalon, and here you can see this is the size of the relative size of the steel encephalon, and especially one part, which is called the nidopallium. This was the largest in these corvids, that is in European jays and carrion crows, and it's quite large in songbirds as well, as compared to other species of birds, which do not perhaps perform such um, co uh, complex cognitive tasks. Nidopalium in birds. Now, the avian caudolateral nidopalium is considered to be home an analogous to the mammalian prefrontal cortex. It has similar connections. The prefrontal cortex is also connected to all other parts of the brain, and so is this uh, NCL region based on various neuroanatomical studies. It's connected to the bird's visual cortex, somatosensory, auditory, and even amygdala regions. And it is found that lesions to this area 
prevented the birds from picking up any kind of discriminative tasks or complex cognitive tasks. A very recent study, this was by Viet and Neder in 2013, they showed that this uh, area was actually had these abstract rule neurons. So what was done was they had taken carry-on crows, two of them, and they trained them on matching either visual cues or auditory cues. So what was done was these birds were placed in front of a touch screen and they were given these uh, images which were either matched or non-matched or tones which were matched or non-matched and they had to press a red, uh, a red dot if it was a non-matched rule or a, a dot if the images or tones were matched. Uh, the scientists performed electrophysiology and they recorded from the NCL neurons and what they found was there were neurons which responded to the non-match condition only, whether it was visual or auditory, or otherwise the matched condition, either visual or auditory. So in fact, this region actually contains these abstract rule neurons and is apparently important for making these kinds of discriminations. It was found that on the occasion that these birds made some kind of an error of judgment, these neurons fired less than they would if they made a correct, uh, judge, a correct call on the choices. So uh, now I would like to move on to uh, what I do in my lab. And I work on zebra finches and also on house crows. Now this is an indigenous species of crows. And amazingly, this is also considered a songbird, along with all these other kinds of birds. Um, nobody would ever think that their, vo their uh, vocalizations are anything uh, melodious, even faintly, but still. So um, what exactly does the brain look like? In, it turns out that the crow brain is actually very similar to a zebra finch brain in terms of brain areas or nuclei which are present in both pallium, in the striatum, and in the thalamus. And the connections in another species of bird, not my species, the species that I'm working on, we haven't started yet, but um, at least in another species of birds in jungle crows, um, another group of scientists have discovered that some of these connections are similar. So again, these are connections between these paleal regions, uh, the striatal regions, thalam thalamus, and then back onto the paleum again. So here's uh, the brain of a house crow. This is the brain of a zebra finch for comparison. The zebra finch has these areas like, for example, area X. This is in the striatum. This is in the paleum. And you can see here faintly, this is a teardrop-shaped structure. That is area X, which is similar to that in zebra finches. Lateral MAN comes along further in the next few sections. And these birds at a more caudal level, they also have this nucleus which is called RA. RA is important for vocalization. So in fact, overall the brain structures in crows, house crows, and zebra finches look similar. And uh, what we also found, we did staining for tyrosine hydroxylase. Now tyrosine hydroxylase is a marker for dopamine. We wanted to look at the dopaminergic system because it is important for various kinds of cognitive functions. And we found the patterns of uh, this tyrosine hydroxylase expression were also similar in zebra finches, crows, and in other mammalian species. So the, vent the substantia nigra ventral tegmental complex is an area which is very heavily, which it produces dopamine basically, so it's bound to be very heavily labeled for uh, tyrosine hydroxylase. And you can see these uh, neurons here and also a large number of fibers in this region in house crows. What we found was when we did a whole series of sections, here's a cross section where you can clearly see this is the striatal portion, the outer part is the pallium. The striatal portion, as I had uh, told you earlier, has a very rich supply of dopaminergic fibers as compared to the outer pallium. The pallium, of course, does also have dopaminergic fibers, and all of them arise from the substantia nigra ventral tegmental area. So uh, just to summarize, the basic organization of the house crow brain is similar to that of songbirds like zebra finches. And in fact, um, both these patterns of tyrosine hydroxylase that we saw were also similar. Um, we think that uh, when we uh, do track tracing, we'll probably find these thalamocortical basal ganglia loops in, zebra, in our uh, species of crows as well, although they have already been found in other species of crows like jungle crows. Now we move on to behavior. We decided to test crows first for pattern discrimination. They are very good at visual discrimination and uh, probably all of you have heard stories about how crows can mob people and attack them if they harm babies or uh, things like that. Now here's a task where this crow had to 
uh, slide a lid. These are boxes with sliding lids, and we have playing cards displayed on them. The six of cards, the, the six of spades was rewarded, whereas the two was not. And over a number of trials in about two weeks, our crew got pretty good at doing this. I'm sorry, the video for some reason is not working. Um, I don't know if this is stopped, but in any case, what you can see is that the crow goes immediately down to the uh, six of spades, opens it, pulls out the food that is present inside that box, and uh, then goes right back to the perch because he knows the other one is not mated. Mine is this one even correct. Just in looking at shape discrimination, crows can uh, tell apart shapes as well. And we had them being able to tell apart a circular shape from a diamond shape one by using the same kind of paradigm. You can see that this crow has gone to the six of spades, has pulled out the food, and he will get back on his perch. So this is a training trial in which this bird was being trained to go to this shape. So you can see the shape has been kept slightly away from the opening of this box. And you can see that the crow is very cautious about pulling out the food. So initially, they're very, very careful about what they approach and what they get out. The other one, it also goes and inspects the other box to see whether there's anything in it. And once it gets trained, then it's very businesslike about going directly to this box, pulls out the food, goes straight back without checking the other one. And in fact, in the same, we also have another trial where you can see that the boxes have been placed in another location in the cage. The crow will very soon come down and repeat. OK, so I'll, I think I'll. Um, the next, set of tasks or uh, issues or experiments that we performed is probably more pertinent to this particular meeting. And this is about mirror self-recognition as a test of self-awareness in these birds. So birds, as you can see, have many opportunities in the, in the wild to observe their reflections. Here's zebra finches uh, in a, near a pool of water and crows in more urban settings. Now, uh, basically, mirror self-recognition is tested by using the Mark test mainly. This is developed by Gallup in 1970. And it's basically what it involves is you put a mark on the animal, either on the monkey or a bird or whatever you're testing, and place it in front of the mirror. So it, the mark is put on a part of the body which it cannot see normally. And you observe whether the, uh, the organism tries to take, pull off the mark. So uh, during the initial stages, this in, would basically involve exploratory and social behaviors because if, um, if whichever organism you're trying to test has never seen its reflection, it probably thinks that this is a conspecific placed along with it. And so it behaves in this uh, way as if it was behaving to another. If it progresses a little further and starts thinking that it is, this is a, a reflection, then it will start doing what is called contingency testing. And it does very peculiar kinds of behaviors to study whether this is itself or a conspecific. And finally, self-directed behaviors using the mirror. Once it has figured out that this is a reflection, then it will start using the reflection, uh, reflection to uh, look at parts of the body which it cannot normally see. So this is seen in humans. It develops in children between 18 and 24 months and in great apes, but not seen in old world and new world monkeys. And elephants and dolphins recognize themselves in mirrors, but it's not seen in cats, dogs, and harbor seals. And for a long time, it was thought that birds do not recognize their images in mirrors because they generally tend to peck on them. But recently, it was shown that 
magpies, which are a species of corvids, do appear to recognize themselves in mirrors. So my idea naively probably at that time was that crows being so smart would recognize themselves in mirrors. They can do many other complex cognit cognitive tasks and they would also be able to do this fairly simple task. So for this, we did exactly what the others did. We placed a mark on one part of the bird, which it could not see, under the throat or on top of the head. And you can see that we used a bright red spot for the zebra finches, red, uh, yellow for crows. These were placed in a cage. We did ran a number of training trials. And after that, what we did was we either placed a mirror and allowed the bird to observe itself, or we placed the mirror but covered it with a board so that it was not able to observe its uh, reflection. Then what we did was we uh, analyzed a very large number of behaviors. We looked at time spent in front of the mirror, vocalizations that the birds made, uh, made and head turns to see whether the birds were paying uh, attention to themselves. Most important for this particular experiment was preening on the neck while facing the mirror to see whether the bird actually uh, observed the mark. And then there were many other features like pecking on the floor, etc., looking behind the mirror, turning clockwise and anticlockwise, which is basically exploratory behaviors. So what we found was that when uh, this test was performed on zebra finches, zebra finches did perform, uh, spend a lot of time observing their reflections, not only during the training trials, but in all the mirror conditions, the zebra finches spent a lot of time looking at the mirror, at the mirror but not during the board conditions, either the control board where there was no mark placed on it or the, when the mark was placed on its neck or on its head, but the board was covering the reflection. This is also true of singing. The birds like to sing a lot and they sang to their reflections and also made a number of head turns to look at themselves in the mirror. Most importantly, and I'll skip this, um, they tended to preen themselves on their neck a lot, so there was a significant increase in preening on their neck with the beak. They also preened themselves on the neck using their feet, and this happened specifically when the mark was present, neither during the training conditions nor during the control uh, board conditions or the other uh, board condition. And this um, basically suggests that zebra finches were able to observe the mark and were aware that there was something different about their reflections. However, strangely enough, they also pecked a lot on the mirror during these two trials. And we don't know exactly what the bird is thinking, unfortunately. So whether it recognizes, it definitely seems to have tried to get off the mark from itself. But why it was pecking on the mirror so much during these trials is something that we don't really know about. Um, Again, I think I should probably skip the video because uh, it might get stuck. But besides, uh, then when we started working on the house crows, we did the similar kinds of experiments on house crows. They did spend a lot of time looking at the reflections. So both during training trials and during the mirror trials, but not during the board trials, they spent huge amounts of time looking at the mirror. Uh, they made more vocalizations also whenever they saw themselves in the mirror and they made a lot of head turns, so they looked at the mirror, paid more attention to it. But when it came to preening on the neck, they, there was no difference in preening in the neck across. In fact, there was barely any preening throughout these different conditions. Neither do train in, during the training periods do they do much of preening, nor in the other conditions. And they did some amount of preening on their wings, but again, not very much. So it appears, at least according to the test, that they don't recognize uh, themselves in mirrors. And uh, here, unfortunately, again, this is probably not going to work, but here you can see this very prominent mark on the bird. But the bird, other than sort of moving around and making some vocalizations, does, uh, does not try to remove the mark from its body. Uh, most of the other um, parameters that we tested, like pecking on the mirrors, looking behind the mirror, turning clockwise, anti-clockwise, were also not very different. And it seemed that crows, after a while of paying attention, thinking that this bird was a conspecific, did nothing much in uh, the box with the mirror in it. So basically what we uh, have found um, is that zebra finches appear to recognize themselves in mirrors, and they pass the mirror self-recognition test or mark test. But on the other hand, while crows can do uh, complex cognitive tasks, including pattern discrimination, they do not recognize their mirror images as their own reflections and tend to treat them as conspecifics. 
In fact, um, there was another study which was on New Caledonian crows, the specialists on tool use, and it was found that while New Caledonian crows can actually retrieve food from a hidden location using a mirror, they still do not pass, pass the mark test. So crows just do not seem to have this ability. So it seems as if there are probably different levels of self-awareness in different species of birds, and this is another interesting area to study and think about. But uh, I was... Uh, listening to Anindya's um, uh, talk on consciousness and basic consciousness and reflective consciousness. And I don't know whether birds really have it, but Pepperberg and Lynn talk about reflective consciousness as having a sense of oneself, awareness of being aware, possession of a theory of mind, ability to practice deception and executive type decision making. <coughs> While um, crows at least don't seem to have a sense of one's own self, Zebra finches may have some of it, I don't know how much. Awareness of being aware is something that I don't know how to test, uh, but maybe that is something that one should do. But they do appear, at least some species, to have a theory of mind, the ability to practice deception, and even executive type decision making. And so I end my talk there with the idea that perhaps with the amounts of neural substrate that these birds have, with the kinds of uh, complex cognitive tasks that they can perform, they should be studied more in terms of consciousness as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Iyengar. Uh, our next speaker and the last speaker in this, se uh, in this session is Dr. V. V. Binoy of the National Institute of Advanced Studies. And he will be speaking to us about animal consciousness, some fishy facts. So good morning. Yeah. So we were hearing the story of evolution. We started from prime, uh, from chimpanzee, then moved to monkey, then came uh, birds. Now we are moving to another organism, which is the base, which is located in the baseline of vertebrate evolution, that is fishes. So when I send, uh, said my friends that I want to check whether fish is conscious or not. First of all, the first comment came from him was, you go and consult a psychiatrist. <laughs> because we never consider fish as a living thing. Rather, we consider them as a vegetable or something like that. So, but the thing is that if evolution or if, if consciousness as a trait is there, it may have an evolutionary history also. So in this talk, I will try to analyze what are the status of uh, the studies which focus fish, con fish con consciousness in fishes as well as cognition in fishes and we will try to know what are the two different schools popular in this area. So if you analyze the history of science itself, the consciousness study, studies of consciousness in animals is not that much uh, promoted. Aristotle himself said that uh, animals can have locomotive souls but rational souls they can't have. And it was supported by Descartes, Descartes also. And we believed that in most of the cases, they are automatons following the instincts. So usually people start the talk by defining the problem. What is animal consciousness? But I'm not going to do that. Why it is, we will know from the, the next slides. We are going to check why we should study animal consciousness. So first of all, the distribution question to know which animals besides human are conscious. And if consciousness is a, is a trait, what is the position at which it has evolved, whether it has an evolutionary continuity. And the second and most popular question, the phenomenological consciousness, what is likely to be a bat, monkey, chimpanzee, fish, insects, butterfly, it goes on. And it has very much importance also because uh, sufferings in animals is an area which is being studied by many people. And we want to reduce that no matter whether it is in laboratory, farms or slaughterhouse. And there are two schools in that, that uh, division of knowledge. One believes that we have to reduce the, psycho the, the physiological stress of the animal, but at the same time other be groups believe that animals also have feelings. And that feelings are important and psychological health and how the animal feels is to be taken care of while designing the well-being measures. But if you start to study or if you think about studying consciousness, the biggest problem comes, the definition of consciousness. 
there is no universally accepted definition of consciousness. If you just check the Oxford Dictionary, you can see that 15 senses you will get for the term conscious and 10 for uh, consciousness. And definition ranges from sleep, wake, sleep, wakefulness to sentient to extended consciousness where the organism or agent will have the capacity for language and higher level of thought. And in, uh, if you go for a non-human species, there are constraints, just like uh, the spe other speakers said. There is no language in which animal can say that, what it is feeling. And uh, the, another problem is we use humans as benchmark species. And if you analyze the history of theories, origin of theories of consciousness, we can found, find that it has, the animals are not considered while forming these theories mainly. Then extending these theories to animals often brings ambiguity. So we have to focus on cognitive the behaviors and neuro endo, neuroendocrinological correlates, just like Professor Somia did. So again, as far as biological analysis of consciousness is concerned, Julian Huxley was a, was a believer that consciousness don't have any connection with behavior. He suggested that it is an epiphenomenon, like uh, bell of a clock don't have any role in keeping the time. And he proved or he tried to prove it by removing the parts of brain of the frogs or by giving the shock to the legs of the frog and he saw it and he proved that if it can move or it can behave there is no need for consciousness or even brain so was morgan's canon so if you analyze the history you can see that morgan suggested in no case we interpret an action as the outcome of exercise of a higher physical faculty if it can be interpreted as the outcome of the exercise of one which stands lower in the psychological scale. So he put a canon there and suggested that animal consciousness or animal cognition study is not that much, uh, if you, that, 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 that is not that much promoted. And that affected the research on animal cognition until cognitive revolution. So then later the animal, many animal models started to come to the, the field. People started to check the cognitive abilities ranging from uh, chimpanzee. So at that period it is called uh, some of the others uh, uh, others, uh, others talks that about that period about uh, studying monkeys, chimpanzees, and slowly other animals also has been started to come into the field. So why should we search for consciousness? Some of the answers we have already given. So it is the lowermost strata of the vertebrate evolution. So almost all the tetrapod vertebrates evolved from some organism which resembles a fish. And more importantly, in many cases, the social cognition is connected with consciousness or evolution of consciousness. So these are the first vertebrate social system. They started a group social system called shawls, where they aggregate into group. And this is the only group which we can use to understand the, create, the evolution of create, creature consciousness in the animal phylogeny. And for welfare also, we need to know whether they are conscious or not. But the difficulties with studying the fishes just like in the other cases, they have hands, legs, or strong beaks. Fishes don't have anything. Only fins are there. And again, another thing, no vocal, ex no vocal communication, no expression, no gestures, which makes the scene more complicated. And more, another difficulty is they are adapted to an ecosystem which is not much familiar to us, the terrestrial human beings. And, uh, but even after that, in the last 10 to 15 years, you can see a big hike in the studies on uh, con even searching for the consciousness in fishes. But many people say that the studies which follows consciousness in fishes are biased. People from the field of animals who follow animal ethics study these kind of things and they underreport and ignore negative results. They, it is faith-based research or interpretation and usually they hypothesize after the results are known, or they try to inflate the science boundary. This is another group which, who believes that fishes cannot be conscious. We will discuss all that in coming slides. But at the same time, Yukoti has an opinion that fishes are the victim of speciesism, because they don't resemble us at any level, and they are far behind us in the evolution. So we cannot believe that fishes can have consciousness. But you should see, the first comprehensive review of cognition and learning in fish came in 1990 only. So it's a very young branch of science. And without having enough evidence, we cannot say that whether fish is conscious or not. OK, let's go through the literature, and we will share some of our work also. 
so the first of all the, the first thing is that these are the major things said about fish conscious fish the, 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 the evidence against fish cannot be conscious because there's a strong belief that fish cannot have long term memory and there is a famous saying called three second memory you may know and which was been propagated by the dory in that film finding nemo who forgets everything and people found that they have very small brain if you go for a large mouth shark it which grows up to 1000 kg it has a brain of around uh, 20 to 30 grams only so very small brain to body ratios and uh, professor matsawa's case or professor india's case or professor samia's case yeah in some cases it's not the animal has an evolved neopallium fishes don't have that also so it's a primitive brain no neocortex no amygdala no hippocampus no dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and one more thing came the full fledged consciousness people expected in amniotes only because it requires lot of investment of energy in the brain maintenance of brain so kabnak and kabnak suggested that cold blooded animals cannot be conscious and more importantly there is no rem sleep in fishes and no stress induced fever cannot experience hedonic states like pain or pressure so this was a situation when the subject started or just like in the beginning of the fish cognition or before 1990 and this is the space at which kabnak suggested that the consciousness has emerged so they suggested that the sign of conscious thing is there should be emotion there should be sensory pleasures there should be play there should be sleep in fishes it is not all these things are not done. and you can see the fish brain also the the it is mainly the optical tectum and the telencephalon is there but it is not like a mammal brain or bird brain let us but what happened that the scenario changed when people started to explore the fishes this was just beliefs in the beginning so let us check the first thing required for a conscious organism sleep and wakefulness it is believed that it is to be the organism has to be or the agent has to be awake to be aware so that is the first step in the beginning in the, in the consciousness so people studied uh, fish sleep or the rest we put it in cotton uh, comma in inverted comma because this this is not resembling human sleep where we close our eyes because fishes don't have eyelid and they go to a place and they rest there and uh, you what you can see that they will change their color in our species the species which we focus they become more dark and if you irritate they won't move away from that place so what they found that the drugs that can alter mammalian sleep system is also working in fishes you can give sleep pills to drug sleep pills to fishes and another thing is that hypo uh, the hippocretin or axin system which promote wakefulness in animals other animals like mammals or human beings that is also found in fishes and another interesting characteristics was the sleep rebound that was also reported in zebra fish we don't know what is happening in other species of fishes and to be aware so the, the if you analyze the consciousness it starts the one of the primary level at which it starts is conscious cognition it's called sentience uh, it's again you know, uh, called sentience also so in this condition the animal should be or the agent should be able to aware of internal and external stimulus and if the, when the animal be or the agent became able to aware of the internal and external stimulus in the next level of consciousness that is primary consciousness or anoetic consciousness which is commonly called in consciousness literature starts it can generate a mental scene in which diverse information could be integrated for the purpose of directing behavior and this kind of mental representation just like in the case of an organism it could be just a procedural representation one stimulus one response so even the machine do that but if it is a declarative representation it permits selective attention to internal and external stimulus and allowing flexibility of behavior and adaptive responses the animal is able to or the agent is able to selectively focus on something and draw it and mix it to to divert its behavior It, this concept is often associated with another concept called proto self this is the primitive form of coherence of world and self representation so in order to become conscious or at least primitive conscious the other organism has to to integrate the information from self as well as the integration from the world and is a template for uh, template for fundamental intrinsic aspect of self again in since we are analyzing fish in cotton cot self 
So let us see whether fissures can represent, uh, develop spatial representation. It was tested in 1951 itself. This is the species was Bethigobius soporator. So what they did that, they made a pool in which the, the gobi was kept and they gave to other pools where water level was different. And they mimicked the low tide situation and they found that gobies always jumped the area or the pools where the more water is available. So they make a representation of their external world as well as they know that I have to jump there. So, any, so the recent study shows that which analyzes spatial or you know, utilization of spatial information in fishes is increasing and they show that they can learn and they can change the spatial map or the cognitive map of the routes they learn. So we try to do another thing using our model system climbing first, we try to test another thing that is decision making. So in decision making animal has to evaluate two cues and according to the value available it has to change it take a decision or reach a decision. So this is our fish. So this is a simple apparatus which we used in our studies. And we tested that usually you know we, we, we believe that fishes follows instincts. So we want to know whether the instincts will be affected by the other cues. If the animal is able to integrate that information, it will be able to integrate that information and the instinct can be modified. So we tested the, uh, the in fishes, there is, it's a standard test, you can give a large shoal and a small shoal and they usually join large shoal because it provides more benefit. So we found that there is an instinct towards large shoal. Then what we did that we brought in the familiarity with the fishes, the other members. So one side there will be a group, other side there will be a group because as far as stimulus, stimulus size and uh, stimulus intensity are concerned they are equal but one is familiar. And we found that they go for familiar fishes. And we even tried for the trade-off to know whether the familiarity can be, that is their acquired uh, uh, cognitive characteristics can trade off with the, uh, the, the instinct that is going for a large group. And we found that that works only when the confusion comes. But the story became very interesting when we tried to test it in another context of a in, uh, context where we tried to test whether the fish has the capacity to use the familiarity in while taking a decision of an of a heterospecific some other species or some species from other uh, some individual from other species so the result was interesting after developing familiarity for 120 days climbing birds never went for its own species so questioning the gene selection so what it do did that it preferred the familiar group of tilapia, which is an unknown, which is a heterospecific fish, which it has seen for the first time in its life, and it never went to went and joined the group of uh, of uh, its own species. So the instincts can be modified. So we tested whether they are able to to, to recognize the individuals, and we found that individual recognition is limited to their own species. So they are able to recognize the individual just like I can recognize you if they belong to the climbing birds. If, if uh, I, other species, even though they develop familiarity, they are not able to do that. So there are limitations for the capacities. So but uh, another interesting study they did, that is from Grosseny group, what they did that they tried to know whether the fish has the capacity for transitive inference. So you may know that if we don't have to test everything, if you know, if you see one group, one, uh, uh, if, if you are able to see two people interacting and, and uh, that the, the first person interacting with another person, you'll be able to come up with a sequence in your brain. So Grosnik et al, what they did that, they tried to understand the interaction pattern or the fighting pattern between the, the members of Astatotilapia bertoni, another kind of fish. So usually what happened that uh, the dominant fish, when a when sub submissive fish, is, fish of, uh, meets a dominant fish, usually they dark, darken their body color to show that, uh, to acknowledge the, this is the superior nature of the other fish. So here what they did that they tried to have a dyad between A and B and C and D and D and E and they tried and, uh, and one fish was allowed to observe this dyad. And they found that this fish was able to position itself in that line. It arranged the, the group according to the fighting ability and it only fought with the members which is below its fighting ability in that line. So as far as cognition is concerned, the, the capacity for monotonicity, arrangement of the, the value the, of something according to the values is one amongst the very important trait that you can see here. So this is another famous example 
published by Milinsky, tit for tat, you may know that. So in these two animals, what they found that they recognize the other individuals and they, uh, they are able to attribute the value to the other individuals and a proto-trust kind of behavior develops here. So in stickleback, what they do that when they go to examine a predator, they go in pairs. So if the, one of the member is a cheater, cheater means in between it will run, run away from that, usually the fish will not go for uh, the predator inspection with that fish. And a similar thing has been seen in egg trading uh, in ham, black hamlet. This fish, what it do that, this is a hermaphroditic fish which produces both egg and sperm and they gather at one place and uh, one fish will provide some egg to the other fish and that fish will pro uh, produce, uh, will uh, inseminate the eggs. Then this fish has to return this, uh, his, or uh, his, we can use his or her, uh, their uh, egg to the other fish and this fish will uh, uh, inseminate that. So there are cheaters again. But they won't give the egg back. They will get the egg from the other fish, they will inseminate it and they will run away. So the fishes will, uh, inter they will remember that fish and they won't go for any egg trade with, with that fish. So they call it the Milinsky, Milinsky's nature paper come with the title tit for tat. That's also seen in fishes. And another capacity called Machiavellian intelligence which is considered to be the, the capacity for, uh, which requires a higher uh, uh, brain centers. That's also been, uh, uh, that also been uh, reported from fishes. This is, uh, this is the, the fish is cleaner ras, the small fish you can see which is sitting inside the mouth of a uh, moray eel. So this fish is a, is a beautician of the ocean and it cleans the teeth and body of the other fishes. You can see there are two rasas cleaning the fishes. So here what they do that, usually while cleaning, just like you know when you go to the beauty farm, especially ladies know, when the beautician plucks the eyebrow, sometimes it will be hurting. So what they do that if the other fish shows such behaviors that hurt, they will do the reconciliation behavior by touching on the face. And another interesting thing is that if, uh, uh, so, uh, so, so they will do that. So what happens sometimes, you know, this behavior if it continues and they have another, another habit, they will eat the mucosa, buccal mucosa from the, the host, sometimes the host will chase them. So in that case, what they will do, they will start to lose the clients. So in ocean, what happens that usually fish comes to the cleaner ras and they will be waiting for the service of cleaner ras. So this bad beautician is going to lose the clients. So what they will do that, they will have resident clients who regularly visit them. They will go there and they will try to show that their image, they are a very good uh, cleaner and they will try to enhance the image. Yeah, so that's called image scoring. So they will try to show by, you know, by touching the known fishes and the others may be going. And if the interesting thing is that if a new fish comes there, it will increase the, the reconciliation behavior shown to the other fishes. So if you analyze whether they have the machinery to do that, you can see that the, the brain center is required for social behavior as well as for reward system is, or to make a social decision making it is present in fishes. You can see all the, uh, the, the areas homologous to the mammalian brain in fishes also. So the, uh, the ultimate thing comes, mirror test. Usually fish don't get a chance to see its uh, reflections. Because just like Professor Sabia said, birds can see in the water because fish is living in the water, it can't see its reflection. So but the ultimate test is mirror test whether the fish has a self or not. So the study shows that uh, if you show a mirror to the fish, this is just like in the case of bird, they will show aggressive behavior. But earlier people believed that this, this, is, this is treating like, an, like the fish is treating the other fish like a, like a conspecific trying to intrude its, its area. But a recent paper which came in 2014, uh, they found that they analyzed the brain uh, variation or the, the CFOS expression, that is the immediate gene, as well as the production of 11 keto, keto testosterone and testosterone and, and the cortisol in the brain in the body of the fish fish when they see a mirror image and a real corn specific and they found that there is there do exist variation it may not be the self recognition but there do exist some variation in, in treating mirror image as well as the real corn specific so this is another thing so self always goes to self control we never expect that fish will be able to do the self-control because it is very difficult even for a primate to do a self-control. 
So people, the group, Dan Eastman and the group, they try to analyze a paradigm called the reverse reward contingency test. Here, what they will do that, in two chambers, they gave, in one chamber, it is a small reward, that is small amount of food. In the large chamber, it is large amount, or in the other chamber, it is large amount of food. So usually, fish will select large food, just like in the case of our case. But that fish will not be available, will be allowed to feed that large food. Instead, they will change the, the, food, the food tray in such a way that if they choose the large food, large amount of food over the small amount of food, it will get small amount of food only. So fish has to learn in such a way that it has to learn in a reverse way that if I choose a small thing, I may get a large thing, just like uh, the people says. So initially they never expected that fish will be able to do that. But later they found that out of the nine cleaner ras they tested, one of them was able to do that. It was a female fish. Whenever this, this decision making thing comes, it uh, follows that uh, reverse, uh, reverse reward contingency test. So we tested the, uh, the, very, the reaction towards mirror in climbing pairs and we found that uh, if you give a mirror, the lateralized utilization of brain, fish has a peculiarity, its body is laterally compressed and there is no isolateral connection towards the cerebral hemispheres. So if the fish has to use its left hemisphere, it has to turn rightwards, means, uh, sorry, leftwards, means right eye directly connected to the leftwards. So it is easy to study the lateralization in fishes because you can do it by observation itself. So what we found was that uh, you can see the eye use pattern towards unfamiliar, familiar, conspecific, heterospecific, and mirror image. And mirror image, the lateral utilization is different. We have the data of around 120 fishes. So the pattern of mirror, lateralized utilization to mirror, towards mirror is also different in fishes. So study shows that, uh, so the, an another thing, whether fish can have uh, emotional fever, just like all of us, if we go through a traumatic condition or a, men or a stressful condition, we feel fever. So though people tried, very recently it was published, if you keep fishes in stressful condition, they will go for, they also develop a situation which could be comparable to the emotional fever. They always go for the area of the water body with uh, warmer water. And they can be addicted to drugs. And there is a famous paper from Jell Rai uh, with the title, Drink Like a Fish. And they have used zebra fish as a model system. And another interesting thing, with the, in connection with the Parkinson's disease or the mesolimbic uh, dopamine system, MTTP is usually given to induce uh, the, the uh, Parkinson's disease in uh, mammals like rats. If you give it to goldfish, it will develop similar conditions. And, the fun, and uh, Derek says that the ocular abnormalities that are common in Parkinson's syndrome can also be induced in fishes by altering dop dopaminergic neurotransmitters. So you can see the neural correlates for, uh, uh, for uh, the capacities uh, which, which, which an organism with amygdala and hippocampus shows, like uh, lateral and medial pali of telencephalons are functionally homologous to hippocampus and amygdala. And uh, for, like other vertebrates, fish telencephalon also receives projection from thalamus. And uh, there is a reward system. And there is a comparison between uh, telios, lateral uh, uh, the pallium and median pallium with uh, human amygdala and hippocampus. You can see most of the things, there is homology. And this is the distribution of dopaminergetic and serotonergetic tick system in fishes. And this is the most controversial topic in fish research, pain. Because pain requires subjective experience. So there are studies which shows that fish can feel pain. But other group says that uh, there is very less C fibers, which is common in mammals which transmits pain. And uh, alpha, uh, alpha delta fibers are very common in fish, fishes. And but uh, some others believe that this is the problem of definition because International Association for uh, Pain Research, they consider pain should be there if, even if there is no stimulus at all. Certain cases people can feel pain if there is no fear there at all. But still the, this contradiction or the research in both fields goes on. And when, uh, when, when we focus on telencephalon and its equivalence to mammalian behavior, over, over and Hall is in 1993 did an experiment. What they did that they separated cerebral hemisphere from the fishes, they removed it. And they left only the diencephalon and brainstem and spinal cord. And they tested it in many species and they found that the fish still keep the capacity for consuming the food, uh, sensory discrimination, social behaviors, including schooling, spawning, intraspecies aggression, etc. 
but there is no studies where they are able to do it take a, take a decision in that case and they use it as a as a evidence against fish does not ha ca cannot have they, they, they could be automaton like uh, uh, our huxley's frog who do, which don't have the brain but shows the behavior and uh, two slides i forgot to add or i didn't add i thought that there won't be time fish can use tools there are studies which shows that, that uh, you may know that uh, archer fish which uh, throws water into the water to get uh, just like an archer uses his arrow it uses water to get the prey sitting outside of the water body and there are studies uh, timmerman study shows that if the experimenter or somebody goes there to disturb it they will use the same tool to to they will throw water into the eyes of the people who is coming to disturb them so they are using that tool and there is another gestural result for gestural communication or the communication between two species are also available in fishes now it is a it is a mutualistic hunting between moray eel and gropers this gropers go there and signal the moray eels the prey is there just like honey honey guided bird and they don't do it to any other predator so the problem with fish consciousness or cognition is that we have 32000 species so you calling it fish and saying that this animal is don't have any capacity to do that or do this we cannot say that because there are 32000 species and each species are adapted to different kind of environment you can see fishes which is living in underground waters no ice and you can see sharks or something like that which is living in different kind of ecosystem and you have a you may have a goldfish which is living in your uh, in your uh, aquarium all of them requires different kind of adaptations so some of some others suggested the, so the, the studies if you conclude we can see that they may have primary consciousness and a proto self and maybe experience to they, are, they may be experiencing the mental states that are qualitatively different from human beings because they are aquatic or organism adapted to some other things and uh, this awareness could be graded because they may be uh, they may be they, they are living in different kind of ecosystems varying in the pressure the selection pressure they have to varying the selection pressure so that much is there about fish and the fishy facts thank you thank you very much um, so uh, we now have time for discussions questions comments uh, just a few simple rules <coughs> i'm sorry may i request uh, uh, those who would like to make comments or questions to please come up to the two microphones uh, at, on the two aisles and line up. Uh, just a few requests. One, you could briefly uh, tell us your name. Please uh, let us know who you're addressing the question to amongst the speakers or to, if it's a general, you can mention that. And a final request is to keep your comments and questions as brief as possible. This is also a request to the speakers uh, so that we are able to accommodate as many questions or comments as we can. Thank you very much. The question is to Professor Matsuzawa. Hello. Um, has there been any attempt in your lab or any other place to map functionally areas of the brain, brain of chimpanzees? Because I have seen you use MRI scans and EEGs. So for example, is there a prefrontal cortex, a frontal cortex, and has that been mapped to emotions and so on, and therefore evolutionarily compared that to humans? Thank you for your question. Uh, two answers. Um, MRI study of the longitudinal uh, comparison from the birth to six years and a half uh, clearly shows us, we published a paper, uh, prefrontal cortex uh, enlargement is very clear in humans and to some extent in chimpanzees, but almost none in monkeys macaques so very clear difference and chimpanzees not in the middle but very close to humans that is one and that is our paper and there is another paper by um, uh, anatomical research in the United States UCSD uh, she compared left hemisphere and right hemisphere and the Broca area of chimpanzees that is larger in the left hemisphere rather than right hemisphere. So in some, there is very little evidence, but we are on the way to get more evidence about uh, brain mechanisms underlying the
cognitive functions. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask another one? Yeah. Uh, this is to uh, Soumya Inger. In in birds, uh, in songbirds, is there evidence of any kind of aesthetic pleasure at all, or is the singing purely mating calls? So uh, songbirds tend to um, do or make two kinds of songs. One is female directed songs, which is to attract a mate, and those tend to be faster. But on the other hand, they also produce a whole lot of what is called undirected singing. So even by, by you know, when the male birds are completely by themselves, they sing a lot. And we don't know exactly why they sing so much, but it might be because, you know, for practice. And they seem to be intrinsically rewarded by that song. So it is possible that they actually enjoy the song. Rick, Ricky Suri here from Jamshedpur and <clears throat> I guess I'm just going to ask this is for the entire panel on the uh, actually the title of the conscious, consciousness cognition and culture so when you juxtapose consciousness and cognition you start thinking of cogn consciousness existing only in the brain and I was just wanted to ask the panel I mean isn't it in my little finger or isn't it in every cell of my body why are we kind of why do we involve it just the brain when we think of consciousness and I guess the other part I have is being an electrical engineer, which I always felt was the most superior part, is, and we might have the answers as we go forward, how much of what messaging occurs is electrical in nature and how much of it is chemical in nature? Because, you know, I also run and they, I understand endorphins are a great drug and they give you those highs and so on. So how, how is consciousness related to electricity on the one hand and chemistry on the other? <laughs> Okay, so <coughs> I'm sorry, I may not be an expert in this. <coughs> I think the reason why we look for consciousness in the brain is ultimately, at least for the higher organisms, it's because even if you talk of sensations and perceptions of our sense organs, ultimately the messages go to the brain and not only is the primary processing done in the brain, but there are also higher centers, primarily in the cortex, which mediate our responses to these uh, sensations. So having said that, therefore the brain clearly is extremely important. There have been various ideas about uh, peripheral consciousness in a manner of speaking, but how that maps to the brain and how much is the brain or the spinal cord mediating many of those responses remains continues to remain an open question the reason why i think it's an open question is because the definition of consciousness has as some of the speakers have pointed out have remained problematic so for example there's a philosopher um, uh, maxine uh, johnston who believes that amoeba are conscious the reason why she thinks so is because if you put a drop of acid in front of an amoeba, it senses the change in pH in the environment and swims in the opposite direction. So the ability of an organism to sense the environment, process the information, and respond in an appropriate way is according to her, and according to quite a few philosophers, a primary definition of consciousness. Now if this is true, and we accept it, then clearly we are talking of consciousness at the cellular level, where there is no brain, it's a single cell organism. Bacteria aggregate together, there's limited social behavior in bacteria. Are these consciousness? It really ultimately depends on how we define consciousness. And so I think my simple response would be that in the higher organisms, of course the brain is extremely important, but what level of functioning of the peripheral nervous system vis-a-vis -vis the spinal cord and the brain would be attributed to what we call conscious activity remains largely, I think, uh, a matter of definition. Uh, I'm not an expert in your second part of your question about chemical systems versus electrical systems, but clearly both are involved. Uh, the, the stimulus travels through neurons electrically, but when you have communication between neurons, it's largely chemical. Uh, uh, from one synapse, across the synapse, and a number of chemical systems are involved. So again, uh, I think a, a lesson that is emerging is that consciousness, we cannot look for one particular center for consciousness, even in humans, for example, in uh, the brain. Uh, there may be a number of centers and they may be involved 
uh, in various aspects of perceptual and reflective consciousness. And depending on which parts of the brain are involved, you may have different involvement of chemical systems and, of course, the electrical activities common across all neuronal transmission. I would also like to just add that if there are members of the audience who would want to respond to some of these questions or would like to add on, please put up your hand and I can. physicist working at the Yoga University. I have evolved a mathematical um, description of a kind of information which contains an information loop, which to which I hypothesize you can apply a, a sense of self. This occurs in amoeba as much as in um, the brain. And it depends in brains on the cortexes being able to achieve a state of criticality, which is well known to occur in all cortexes which have been investigated. Thank you very much. Uh, to begin my talk, I said, I'm very much pleased to be here to talk about my study on chimpanzees. I came here to talk about my study on chimpanzees and I showed you the facts, scientific evidence. Based on my own research, I never cited any other researches. It's based on all my research and talked about the facts. And if you carefully listen to my talk, I've never used the word consciousness. I never use the word consciousness. I talked a lot about cognition, and I talked a little about culture, cultural tradition of nut cracking. For me, I think we, the speakers, presented the materials for you to think about what is consciousness, how to study consciousness, <laughs> and at least for me, I have no intention to talk a lot about consciousness, no. I wanted to show the results and facts and evidences for you to think about the consciousness. Thank you. Thank you. From my childhood, I am so much attached to those creatures. I wanted to learn more on that. And my second uh, question is to Professor Ayangar. Uh, right from the childhood, we have been told that the cuckoos or the coels they never lay the egg in their own nest. They lay the eggs in the nest of the crows. So any research has been done on that and why it is so? Um, they, um, yes, I mean, they do lay their eggs in crows' nests. They don't take care of their young. And uh, crows, on the other hand, happen to be really good parents. So since these are parasitic in that way, I mean, um, that's why they have this behavior. But specifically, I mean, more on that, I am not aware. I think some research should be conducted on that. Can I just yes, add sure. a comment to that? There has been quite a bit of behavior done in, uh, with the European cuckoo uh, to try and understand the strategies that the cuckoo uses uh, to lay its eggs and parasitize the eggs of hosts <coughs> and the counter behavioral responses of the hosts. I'm not, I don't have time to go into the detail, but there are a whole range of extremely complex behavioral strategies that both the cuckoos use to parasitize and the hosts use to resist. What would be interesting is how much of these behaviors are cognitively sophisticated and how much of them have been selected in the course of evolutionary time simply because of selective advantages. The reason why I'm saying this is because one of the hallmarks of truly sophisticated cognitive behavior, as some of the speakers have talked about, is decision making, where you have enough flexibility. So you may see very complex dance language in the honeybees, but they are very rigid and they operate only almost as if they are under strong genetic control. So although these behaviors may appear to be complex, they may not be considered cognitive 
because the flexibility is missing. So your question is a very good question because clearly there is a counteracting strategies that the two species have to use. How much of this is rigid? How much of this is flexible? How much of individual variation exists? It may even be cultural, it may be individually learned, is something that have not been looked at from that perspective, but I think it's important. And my last uh, question is to Professor Matsudawa. Uh, professor, uh, I have visited uh, Kyoto University, but I was so <laughs> unlucky that I was not knowing that you are been into such type of research, I missed a lot. I must have visited your research center that time during my stay in Tokyo. My question is to you, uh, suddenly, we find a deviant behavior in the monkeys uh, seen in northern India. My in-laws are from uh, Uttar Pradesh and recently, 15 days back, there was a news that one poor pandit from the priest from the temple, he was killed by a group of monkeys. Uh, uh, they, he was stoned to death. And it is not the one incident, but it has happened three times in Bihar. So especially the Bihari monkeys, they have become so smart now so they are more smarter than the Japanese chimpanzees or maybe the African orangutans. Why it is that, that deviant behavior is seen amongst those monkeys? Because Patna was the same Patna before. Nothing has changed in Patna. But why the behavior in those monkeys are changing now? And in, during the last three months' time, three persons have been killed by those monkeys. They were stoned to death. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, well, there are 300 species of non-human primates. And I want to give the most uh, impressive case of the unknown. Up to the 20th century, we believed only chimpanzee use a pair of stones to crack open nuts. Uh, it's a lithic technology and that is cultural tradition of my research site in Bosu, Guinea. So all primatologists believed only chimpanzee, a evolutionary neighbors of humans, can use stones to crack open nuts. But in the 21st century, capuchin monkeys in Brazil use huge stone to crack open nuts. Or even more recently, uh, long-tailed macaques you have been in India, not in India, but in Thailand. They use stones to crack open mosque. So we have many things unknown. So I do not know the monkeys in Uttar Pradesh. <laughs> uh, but there might be interesting things undiscovered. So I'm waiting for the detailed reports published in the Science Citation Index journals. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Pooja Soni, and my question is to you, sir. The chimp you showed certainly has a sequence from 1 to 10 in its short-term memory. And the next step could be uh, naming such information, because the same thing happens with the with say a human child. First it, it has a sequence of uh, information in its memory and then it starts uh, comparing. It says yes, this is this. I, co uh, I, I could summarize my question to um, asking whether the chimps have the is uh, knowledge, saying this is this. Like um, my another question is this. Uh, the, the chimp uh, was very, uh, um, the chimp had no, uh, no problem in uh, playing with numbers, but uh, w would the chimp react to the same uh, shape, to the shape of say one uh, made, made in wood? Would the chimp had uh, responded the same way um, as it did with the um, monitor screen? So there are two questions. Sir. Which one should I answer? <laughs> the first one is related to the second one, sir. And I believe uh, learning is senses specific. 
if you if a child touches a screen and recognizes the shape one it should also recognize something uh, in the shape one made in wood or something else so maybe that is the differentiating factor <coughs> between a human child and uh, a chimp i think I'll, i get your point um 30 years ago, I published a paper in Nature. The title is Use of Numbers by a Chimpanzee, Chimpanzee I. He is the first chimpanzee who utilized Arabic numerals to represent the number. And in this case, I showed real, actual items. Pencils, glass, toothbrush, whatever. Regardless of the object and color, the chimpanzee eye can name the particular objects and the number and the color. So I think um, or even more, the chimpanzee eye had the spontaneous double quote word order uh, representing the objects, color name, object name, and the number, or object color name, and then number. Anyway, the number is located in the last position. So in this case, it's not really syntax, but the chimpanzee capability of representing the outer world by language-like skills is very, very uh, abstract and similar to human cases if you give intensive training. So. I don't deny the previous uh, studies by Western scholars to talk much about ape language studies, but my position is very clear. I'm not favor to the chimpanzee. Uh, very much language-like skill is uniquely human. So even the word level, as I have told you, it's very difficult for chimpanzee to learn. So this kind of generalization or abstract things is very, very limited in chimpanzees. That is what I want to communicate with you. So one more question. Thank, thank you. Could we, maybe you thank can you. follow it up during lunch. Uh, so my name is Pooja Sahani, and I'm an environmental consultant. Presently, I am a research scholar at IIT Delhi. And uh, our humble investigations are in the field of natural environments and consciousness. And sir, my one question is to you, uh, to sir uh, Matsuzawa sir. And sir, I would really want to know, you've observed uh, chimpanzees both in lab and you've also observed them in natural settings, sir. So is there a marked difference in probably cognitive behavior which, you've would, uh, which you would have observed? And what is that, sir? And uh, the second part is more of a comment from the panelists, sir. Uh, as Binoy, sir, had uh, mentioned Huxley's statement on uh, that there is no relation of consciousness on behavior, sir. So I would like to uh, hear your comments on that. So two questions. First is directed to you, and the other is actually open to the entire house. OK. Uh, my answer is as follows. Uh, I'm very rare case of doing the research of chimpanzees in the wild and in the laboratory. So parallel efforts really important for, under, for me to understand the chimpanzee as a whole. You, you, I, I really want to know the chimpanzee as a whole. So for example, today I did not mention much about mother-infant relationship, living in a group of chimpanzees. That group is con uh, confronting to the neighboring communities. All those things cannot be replicated in the laboratory. So I really need to go to Africa to see the reality, how their intelligence is utilized in their natural habitat. Actually, in the tropical forest, there are 600 species of plants, and among them, 200 species are consumed by chimpanzees. And they have the cognitive map. Where is the fig tree? Where is anana? So 
those kind of things I experience in the field and abstract the important questions and that must be tested in the laboratory. So that is my way. Yeah, so about the Huxley and yeah. So first of all, uh, you should know the note that that comment was given in 1857 or something like that. At that time, anthropocentrism was totally, uh, they were not allowing anthropocentrism in the studies connected with any, animals. And there was a thought, uh, now also, as far as animals are concerned, I am not talking about human beings where many behaviors are conscious or many behaviors are unconscious, just like blind sight, which uh, where uh, you may not need to be conscious to show that behavior. But there was a question, because it's called uh, adaptive automaticity. So in a real life situation, in a wild situation, being automatic is a very good thing. So people suggested that animal follows adaptive automaticity because it's like just like a reflex. And there's a trade-off between the adaptive automaticity and the complexity of the world. So people suggested that when in a social world, you, there is a trade-off between adaptive uh, uh, automaticity versus the cognition required, where you can't be quickly, be, be quickly react to the stimulus. So this is like many behaviors are uh, conscious, many behaviors are done without the awareness, even in the case of human beings also. So in fishes, we don't know how much aware they are. You know, I told all that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, if I may just add a quick comment. People have shown now their papers on this, which show that the same mathematical operations can be done by people, either consciously or unconsciously. The advantage of doing it unconsciously is that you're much quicker, as Binoy pointed out, but you're not aware of what you, the operations you've done. So you cannot transmit that information to other domains. The advantage of doing it consciously is that you can consciously apply your knowledge to various domains, but the trade-off there is that you're much slower. So whether Srinivasan Ramanujan or Shakuntala Devi actually did their mathematical processing unconsciously, and therefore they were not really sometimes aware of the steps that they followed, remains an open question. Thank you, Shari. I'm a master student of biotechnology. My question is to Binoy, sir. sir uh, in uh, fishes, there is a mechanism, is a defensive mechanism known as shoaling and schooling. So, <clears throat> do you think that is a, as Professor Aninda said, that is a, they know, I, I mean, theory of mind describes to knowing other's mental state. So, do you think there is a shoaling and uh, schooling behavior is a such kind of example? Uh, in shoaling and schooling, you, especially in the schools, you need not to be, so the study show, schools, there is a difference between fish groups called schools and shoals. So shoals are defined as the aggregation of fishes for social reason. There is no position, there is no hierarchy, something like that. Even they, they work like a fish and fusion society. But in a school, they move in a specific form and their positions are, uh, are uh, uh, fixed. So. As you said, this theory of mind in fishes, it's, it's started getting, uh, the people started, started exploring that. Mainly it comes from cleaner ras. It's not a shoaling fish. So there I told you about image scoring where the fish behaves in such a way that the image in the other, other fish's mind, the value of the image in the other, the other fish's mind enhances. So there, in, um, even though the fish groups or the fish shoals moves as a single organism, there, there is no need for the theory of mind is required because there they, what they do that they adjust the position with the nearby members. So it's like a fluid, uh, fluid, so usually people use this fluid dynamics model to define that because it's like a one fluid uh, moving in another fluid and the molecules try to arrange the, the, them using the force. So similarly, they adjust the position by keeping the position of the other fishes. So theory of mind is not required to move like that. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Priya Prasad. I'm a lay person, and I'm sorry if my question uh, is probably scientifically inaccurate, but I will ask it. Uh, but I will ask it. It's directed to Professor Matsuzawa. Uh, you showed that in um, non-human primates, sometimes, um, uh, I mean, the learning happen. Uh, you know, it is not taught by um, imitation. I mean, I mean, they do not learn by imitation. Now, I had read somewhere about mirror neurons in human beings and how they are instrumental in transmission of culture in human societies. Do you think that's one of the primary reasons? I mean, are those not there in uh, non-human primates? Is that the reason why uh, learning doesn't happen through imitation? So that's my question. 
I'm not really sure if this is scientifically accurate, but yeah. And, and oh, yes, it, I, I understand. No, no, I, and, the, and the other, uh, mm. you know, question is probably to, the, to all, the, all the people here, is that uh, are mirror neurons only there in human beings? I mean, is that, uh, yeah, so I guess. Well, mirror neuron was first reported by Rizzo Ratti, Italian uh, psych scholars. And that was found in macaques, monkeys, rhesus monkeys. And um, it's still controversial how mirror neurons uh, distributed the other animals, including humans. And so uh, always when we talk about imi imitation, um, people who are interested in the brain-mind association always attribute the things to mirror neurons. But interestingly, macaques, in which we found mirror neurons, they do not imitate. Yeah, macaques, definitely, they can't imitate at all. And chimpanzees, they do. And humans, we do. Uh, that is one point. And the imitation, okay. You may say the glass, it's empty. No water at all, because I drank it. But someone may say, oh, Professor Matsuzawa, look at the bottom. There are a little drops. What I wanted to communicate with you today is, yes, chimpanzee can do imitate to some extent, as the video clips I showed you. The first trial, no problem to imitate, but in nut cracking stone tool use, every day they see, every day, and in such a close distance, but they cannot imitate. There is a paper titled Teaching in World Chimpanzees by Christoph Bosch. A uh, field uh, scientist of wild chimpanzees, he is an expert, and he reported the possible two cases of active teaching in wild chimpanzees. Show the stone tool you to very slowly in front of the child. But the important point, he has observed the scenes for 10 years. And for 10 years, and he reported only two possible cases. So this means 19.9.9% they don't imitate. So I, I really wanted to communicate with you this kind of facts. To say yes or to no, it's completely up to you. Yeah, and again, just a quick comment. So if you want, actually, when you look at social learning, it's a continuum again. And imitation is, of course, at one end, cognitively the most sophisticated kind. But there are other steps of social learning that chimpanzees, monkeys, and perhaps other species are also capable of actually displaying. For example, emulation or social facilitation. Sometimes animals learn very, very quickly, but they use completely different mechanisms of learning. So there are parallel mechanisms by which learning is done. Cognitively, of course, imitation is the most sophisticated kind, and that's the one Professor Matsuzawa was uh, sort of addressing. From the University of Calcutta, uh, my question is to Dr. Sinha. While uh, in the slides, you showed that social attractiveness was the basis by which the B and C monkeys were being categorized. But I want to know uh, whether... No. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Whether there is any primary basis of this distinction, she'll be dominant and she'll be subordinate, and they she, then comes the next. Is there any primary basis for this distinction? And uh, is cognition somehow related to these posts? Okay, so let me quickly summarize. So there is a dominance hierarchy, and that is independent of social attractiveness. So when I define A, B, C, they are socially dominant individuals in that order. Let me just make a point here that I was making to someone else at T. 
In female macaques, the social dominance hierarchy is entirely culturally determined. So you're born into, if you're born to a dominant mother, you're dominant all your lives. What I did try to do was look at social attractiveness as an independent parameter in terms of the grooming received, independent of your positions in the hierarchy, and how consistent this grooming is from all other members, females of the group. And there what I found in that particular group that I reported was the more subordinate individuals tended to be socially attractive. But this is not necessarily true in all troops. In other ecological situations where there is competition for food, much more accentuated, the higher, social attractiveness actually goes the other way around, with dominant individuals being more socially attractive. So that's an independent parameter that I wanted to mention. And therefore, again, the important point is that I think there is a tremendous amount of variability across groups, across individuals, that we have not really documented. I think even in the wild, even for monkeys, it's extremely important to understand how individuals learn in the course of their lives different social rules that prevail in the group. And some of these are culturally transmitted. The last point I wanted to make with regard to how much of this is cognitive, if you look at 85% of the cases where C as the most subordinate individual retreats, there is nothing cognitive in it. At least this, using Morgan's canon, we don't need to invoke any cognitive decision making. However, what I wanted to draw attention to the point was that when you have minority cases of 15% when B leaves and breaks this very simple social rule, you have a cognitive basis for it. So it's exactly, I think, analogous to what I was giving as an example. <coughs> when you cross the road every day and look left and right, that's not very cognitive. It is an associative learned paradigm, of course, it was cognitive in some sense, but not, it does not require rationalization. On Sunday, when you stop looking left and right, you've, it's become a cognitive process. And so therefore, it's a continuum again. And I think we need to understand this variability of when a certain decision which becomes a part of your life, like a habit learned by association, may take on a cognitive turn where the decision becomes a little more sophisticated. And my second question could is I, to... Uh, may I sort of, sorry, uh, could we have this, uh, your second question Thank afterwards you. at lunch? So that everyone has a chance. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dhee and I'm a student of psychology. My question was a bit uh, vague and big, but uh, has your work studying different species changed the way you conceptualize consciousness? Is that addressed <laughs> to me or to? Everyone. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fish. <laughs> no, no, you can start. No, no, I, I think both of you should. <laughs> uh, in my talk itself, I said, so earlier, that was, that was a scenario which I, I when I started working up on, uh, work, when I started working on fishes, until that for me, fish was just a vegetable, as I told. But what happened that, uh, there is a, another problem. This is again considered as a second, uh, it's, it's an error. Usually what happened that, after some time, by the familiarity itself, you will start to feel many things. So somebody has suggested, it was, I doubt it is D.K. Chesterton, who said that, uh, Observing something into, looking into something for long is research. Then you start to see things which is not seen by other people. So slowly what happened that you will start to, we have another, another, another behavior called biophilia. We extend ourselves to another animals. So we may feel that that animal is feeling pain and all that. So it affects, obviously affects, because for 10 years, just like in Professor and in Sinna's case, he spent around 10 to 22 years observing monkeys only. So he also will start to see many things which is not seen by others. So it affects, obviously it affects. So I started studying cognition in crows very recently, but it's uh, definitely there that you start uh, noticing individual differences among birds the more you study them. So it's not the case that all of them behave exactly alike. There is also this matter of familiarity. If you go and handle the crows every day, they are fine with you. But the moment somebody else walks into the room, they will not behave properly. So that is definitely there. In fact, even in the mirror studies, although I said that by and large crows don't recognize uh, themselves in mirrors, there was one bird which somehow, I mean, I didn't mention it because we could never figure out how this bird did it. It was away from the camera, and whenever it would turn back, the mark would not be there. 
Now, whether it has figured out some amazing way of rubbing itself off against the bars of the cage or something, we don't know, but we can't really report it until we actually see the bird. So maybe there was this one genius bird amongst the group of crows that I had which actually passed the test, but I just have to do more birds to find out. Good afternoon. I'm Bijan Chattopadhyay. My question is for Professor Soma. Um, uh, it's about a bird's behavior. That how do they learn their nest building? That architecture is always very interesting to me. Selection of material and the weaver birds and the crows and the eagles, they have different materials and different way of making their nest. Yes. I mean, how do they learn it or how do they implement it? So um, a lot of it I think is genetic, but then um, I, uh, especially as far as buyer weavers are concerned, what I do know is that the first time weavers live in big flocks and they make those beautiful tube shaped nests. So the first time that they do this, and they do it seasonally, so it's only in the monsoons that they make it and that's when they turn, you know, their colors also change. And then a flock of females comes visiting and they select their mates from there. So bio weavers will make more than one nest at a time and the younger ones tend not to be very successful the first year around. So it's the older, more experienced males which will make more beautiful nests. They will make more than one of them and they will, uh, you know, set up families with more than one female. So uh, by the next year around, the young ones probably learn how to make a better nest um, in terms of looking at the others and how to make it. But exactly how that learning process takes place, is there any particular circuit that is involved? But probably I think nobody has actually looked into it, but probably there must be something because again, buyers don't make their nests throughout the year. They make it only once in the year and then that too at the time for breeding. So it's an interesting question that, you know, it's, it's, it's genetic as well as uh, it, it's through experience yes, they yes. develop no, it. Yeah. And uh, just a small I'm question. I'm sorry. Sir. I, I, Very small. I think you're really it's running out of time. Stability of the partnership in birds. I'm sorry? Stability of the partnership in birds. So uh, some birds are uh, monogamous. So for example, zebra finches are highly monogamous. That's the songbirds that I work on. But it has been shown that occasionally they partner other birds, and that's uh, but most of the time they are monogamous. But there are other birds, like for example, buyers, they mate with more than one. So it's not something which is constant in species. Crows, for that matter, are highly bonded, and they stay together most, mostly once they form bonds. Hello. Uh, my name is Shiva Kumar. I'm from Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning. My question is to Professor Sinha. I'm personally interested in the impact of animal consciousness on human consciousness, the interplay between them. And I'd like to take this small example which happened recently. Recently, there was a news item along with a debate and a controversy. A chimpanzee had taken a selfie. It had taken a selfie of itself. And the question that came was, to whom this selfie belongs to? Who can commercially use it? Is it the chimpanzee? or the owner of the chimpanzee or any other person. Suppose in the future, we just saw from Professor Matsuzawa's research, the tremendous memory that is there with the chimpanzees. If humans can learn this memory secret, the commercial interests are extraordinarily high. To whom does this intellectual property belong to? What are the intellectual property issues involved? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think this is extremely complex and maybe we can discuss this later. I don't think we have time to really look at it. Just one small correction. The selfie was by a Sulawesi macaque, not by a chimpanzee. But nevertheless, uh, I think your question remains. Perhaps we can take this up uh, at more, at greater, at leisure. Yes, please. My name is Mohammad Rafi. I'm actually working in artificial neural networks. I'm from uh, RJKD. So, uh, coming to the unconsciousness does the unconsciousness is uh, derived from uh, learned and knowledge based uh, things or uh, sometimes uh, like you said uh, building the nest and uh, the domination of the monkeys are there uh, genetically they, uh, some memory is there in the gen ge genes of the parents uh, that can be transferred to their uh, siblings means uh, uh, their uh, next hierarchy Means does genes carry some information from the parents to the other things? And uh, this uh, 
means this consciousness is mostly in the in animals it is completely related to the visual information does anything has to do with the uh, audio or sensory somatosensory or means does the animals communicate with each other in terms of audio means uh, uh, voice and vocal we are uh, saying that non verbal species um Okay, so I'll just take uh, briefly respond to you. The first is that's how genes work, right? So there is a transmission from parents to offspring of uh, genes. Whether these genes are structural genes, whether they are functional, whether many genes are involved in determining a particular behavior, whether there's a cascade, really varies across situations. What you might have also been referring to are epigenetic modes of transmission, where there could be structures. mediated by genes that form in parental cells in the gametes which may be transmitted to the zygote and to other generations and there's some work on cellular transmission of uh, epigenetic uh, structures but maybe we can discuss that slightly later as far as your second question goes i'm not very clear what you meant but uh, is there verbal communication yeah, other across than, other than visual uh, communication between the animals yes the most of the animals learn from the visuals what means the domination can be seen in terms of visuals uh, how the domination can be seen in terms of audio means like various sounds the birds or monkeys or chimpanzees make yes this that that uh, does that sound carry any information in it of course yes um among about 300 primate species uh they really use not only visual communication but also olfactory communication and tactile communication and of course auditory vocal communication and here i'm i always talk about chimpanzees and chimpanzees most uh marked vocalization is as follows <laughs> that is called pantfoot and the meaning is hi hello <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a long call a long distance call so you can hear the voice and you can hear the reply from far place <laughs> so they exchange the voice to know who is there to make the decision to join or to retreat okay my point for you the sounds are a hard like ho 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 wow no 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 if you carefully look at the chimpanzee vocalization in a face to face situation the same shape of the mouth but bless out and in out in so chimpanzee way of vocalization is completely different from humans suppose that i approach to the dominant male again the vocalization is ah, 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 ah. so bless in out in out in out that is chimpanzee way of vocalization so human way of vocalization what is the universality of human languages thousands languages that is bless in and out stop out stop out stop namasutka yeah So uh you, humans has a uh, universal future among humans that is completely different from chimpanzees and we are so good at uh managing controlling the voices much better than chimpanzees to change the frequency and the rhythm and every other auditory features we are really vocal animals Uh, I'm extremely sorry but I don't think we have time for more questions. Uh if you don't mind we can discuss over lunch over tea again. I'm really sorry. Uh I would just like to close uh this session uh by thanking all the speakers, 
the members of the audience for their questions, comments, for being here. Thank you very much. And I just want to end by just highlighting two or three uh, issues that I think we have to remember. First, how do we define consciousness? How, we def how do we define different levels of cognitive abilities? are very important for us to decipher whether individuals are cognitive, are decisions cognitive, are they conscious? What are the behavioral correlates of many of these higher cognitive abilities that we've been talking about? Some in the laboratory, as Professor Matsuzawa talked about, or as Dr. Iyengar pointed out, or even Dr. Binoy. Some of it may be in the wild, as I mentioned in my talk. And I think what must also be recognized is the importance of field studies where you are able to look at natural behavior of animals but where you cannot do controlled experiments and then taking some of these questions to the laboratory where more controlled questions can be done but under environments that may not necessarily be natural and that one has to remember what are the brain correlates both structural and functional of many of these higher cognitive abilities maybe of consciousness is all very important but final point I think is that of our faith of our own belief in how we look at other species, whether we think they are conscious, they are not conscious. And in this, I don't think there's any better way to end this than I will just read two lines from the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, which was announced in July 7th, 2012, by a leading group of researchers on cognition and consciousness in animals. And they say, <coughs> and I quote, we declare the following, the absence of a neocortex does not appear to preclude an organism from experiencing effective states. Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrates of conscious states, along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. Consequently, the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds, and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess these neurological substrates. This is the Cambridge Declaration. And so therefore, this I think has very important implications of how we perceive other animals, how we treat them, and more importantly, how we determine our own position in this natural world. Thank you very much once again.